Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's great to have you with us. It is great to be welcoming somebody who I think is going to touch on a topic today that is ultra relevant to everyone listening. And if you're listening right now, chances are you're either looking at your phone, looking at it at a tablet, your computer, glancing at a TV. Regardless, it is just plain difficult for us to maintain our attention, and pretty soon we'll be looking at our watch. And I think for marketers, that spells trouble. And that's why I'm so fascinated by the work of Ben Parr, managing partner of the dominant fund, but most importantly, the author of a book that's going to teach us what it means not only to captivate an audience, but to be able to grab attention. So Ben, great to be with you. Thank you for having me. I mentioned kind of beforehand, you're a highly intelligent guy, let's face it. Um, Your work in the past commanded attention. You guys did an amazing job in your previous role. But before researching this book, how did you approach this whole area of attention? Because unless you guys got attention at Mashable, nothing mattered. Well, Mashable was interesting from two perspectives when it comes to attention at least. One was uh, the attention we received and you know, I, I think a lot about how I chose stories and how I assign stories to my staff because I, at my heyday I had like, oh, I could have several hundred if not close to like a thousand emails per day in my inbox from different pitches and then how do you choose one to five a day tops to write about and then the other flip side is how did we get you know getting attention for Mashable and one of the interesting things that we did this is just a fun little story is that in the very beginning when we established our expertise in social media uh, the thing we did was teach our audience how to use it It, like we literally wrote articles like how to retweet and how to share a blog post that you can find the post where I taught people how to share a blog post and this seems crazy now but back then it was so brand new people needed to be taught and we did it, and guess what the first thing they used their new knowledge on was? Us. And so we kind of reaped the benefit of that kind of cycle and establishing our expertise, which is one thing I'll discuss, I discuss in the book, is how establishing expertise captures attention. Well, it definitely captures attention, and obviously you succeeded, and, you, and, and Mashable is still incredibly resourceful. When you were in charge, what worked particularly well? I mean... It was the combination of news stories and evergreen content. You know, we would have the breaking news and pair it with, you know, features. Like uh, we would write, you know, when Google Google Wave or Google Plus first came out, we'd write the news stories and we'd have access, but we'd also write the guides to them and how to use them. And we'd extensively test them and write uh, thorough information about how these things worked. And that went, those things went really like viral and worked really well and were really useful because, again, it was really useful stuff. And it was that combination that really put us over the top. Well, right, at, right up front in the book, you talk about, you distinguish between immediate, short, and long-term attention. Maybe it'd be a good idea for you to share an example that kind of demonstrates how that works. So um, one I write about in the book um, in the first chapter is Super Mario. And so... I'm going to give a quick lesson on the three stages, and then I'll tell about Mario. But basically, immediate attention is the first stage. It's our immediate uh, subconscious reaction to certain sights, sounds, and stimuli. It's when we turn our heads because of a gunshot or something like that. Second stage, short attention, short-term focus on something. It's when we pay attention to maybe a game or a level. And the final stage of attention, long attention, is long-term interest in something. It's the difference between playing a game and becoming a fan of a franchise or listening to a Beyonce song and buying all her albums. And so what Mario and Super Mario and the creator of Super Mario, Shigeru Miyamoto, who I interviewed, um, got right, was was going through those three stages. They really thought about how to make Mario himself pop. In fact, you know, he told me a fun story of how uh, they only had 16 by 16 pixels to create Mario, and so they had to do things to make him distinguished with just that space. So they couldn't. They had to give. They gave him a mustache because you couldn't see his nose otherwise. That's also why they gave him a big nose, and they gave him a cap because they couldn't make the hair, and they made his overalls red because it was the one way to make sure that people could see him, and that worked out really well. But it's also the gameplay design and how they make it so that um, you always want to go to that next level and achieve that next reward, and then long attention, which is you know they you build a relationship with those characters and the familiarity and the storyline. 
you go to an individual Mario game for the gameplay, but you go to the franchise um, because of you love the characters, you love uh, what Mario symbolizes, you love the kind of gameplay mechanics that they bring game to game to game. Well, it's contagious. Obviously, it's contagious, and and it's very addictive. I mean, my my own. I see I see it with my own kids. But so the rule of thumb to get that immediate attention is obviously to ignite emotion, especially negative emotion. So, um, it just it's it's immediate attention is that is the subconscious and unconscious reaction. Emotion is a very powerful thing at all three stages of attention. Um, I talk about you know how there was there was like a research study a few a few years ago and they wanted to get attention for a very mundane topic uh, which was like tropical diseases and they titled the article the journal article you know an analysis of a piece of shit i don't know if i can swear here but i just did yes you can but when they had that it got a bunch of attention in press and it got it helped it move and that was just the uncon that was just the visceral reaction that got initial attention but it's the emotional resonance that makes for long-term attention. One of the people I interviewed was Jonah Peretti, the founder of BuzzFeed. And BuzzFeed specifically focuses on the EQ mm -hmm. instead of the IQ uh, for the most part. And that's why some of their top articles really go viral because they really focus on the emotional aspects and the emotions of the individual. You think about the dress. Part of the reason the dress went off was because you were on one side or the other. And the same reason why their articles like, you know, 50 – five things that only kids in the 90s would understand. It's because it's an identity. It's an emotional identity. The emotional aspect does matter. Well, I want to get to the law, to uh, to the reputation piece in a second. But when, when I'm thinking, when I'm hearing you, I'm thinking of long-term attention. And I'm assuming that reputation is the catalyst to long-term attention, or is it not? Uh, so reputation is one of the is one of the key triggers of my book. I have seven keys, captivation triggers as I call them. I think there's several keys for long attention. Reputation is for sure one of them. And in the book I describe how we have deference and pay extra attention to what I call reputable sources. Experts, authority figures, and the crowd. Most specifically experts. We have, like there was a research study done at Emory University where they found that we, the decision-making centers of our brains, just literally shut off whenever we're listening to an expert. And it's funny because it sort of makes sense because when if you're listening to a doctor and doctor gives you a medication prescription, you should probably listen to that doctor. He or she has much more knowledge than you. But it also does make us pay attention to experts that may not necessarily be experts. Uh, reputation is really, really powerful because it sets the frame for how people view a person and – by immediately saying, you know, immediately having those credentials, we automatically pay attention, whether, you know, it's a Beyonce or Sheryl Sandberg. Yeah. The big challenge today, is, as you know, is that everybody's an expert, right? Everybody's online. Everybody's a publisher. Everybody promotes themselves as experts, you know, so it's really difficult to kind of, if you don't do the research to be able to distinguish the real ones from the ones who, who are, it's more of a vanity. Well, I think that there's still, I think one of the things the book helps people do is defend their attention and know that you, you're more like, you're likely to shut down your brain if you hear the word expert. And hopefully people will think a little bit about that more when they read the book and think about, is this person an expert or not, you know? All right, one more question and I'll get to the seven triggers. You're an investor, you're a mentor, you're an entrepreneur yourself. When it comes to attention, what do you find most startups get wrong? They, with their pitches, like there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, I'll start with their pitches. The biggest issue is always that they think that long emails and cold pitches will work, and it just doesn't. They, it just, I still get them all the time, and I never, I, I just wonder why they don't network. One of the things with reputation triggers that if you have someone on your, if you have someone on your team, if you have a reputable uh, advisor if you focus on getting one of those it really helps open up the rest of what you're doing you know i'm gonna like people just naturally are gonna look at an email and i talk about this i call it the credibility rule people are gonna naturally look at your email if it says that mark cuban's an advisor or um you your team is ex googlers versus just a and you make it really short and simple and straight to the point the problem with inv emailing investors you know two pages or journalists for that matter is that we don't have time. We don't have time to look through all of that. You need to get really quick to the point 
and get people to say yes or no and get people to be like, yes, I want to learn more or no, this is not for me. The problem is when you do long emails, you just don't get an answer because no one has the time to process that. Yeah, long emails or even long articles. Well, how about the ones who nail it? How about the startups that you've been around who nail it? What did, where is their commonality, the ones who get it right? Community is the great ones do a great job of building long-term community and building positive communities. And so I think about things like one of the apps I'm an investor in is a company called Shots, which is, has an amazing positive community because and really focuses on anti-bullying and positive emotions. And it works really well and it builds for a place where you don't feel afraid to post something. And I feel like places like Instagram and others, and Snapchat even, are positive communities, you know? Unlike maybe a Secret or something, where that an anonymity creates, releases some negativity sometimes. But the best startups build great communities, and great investors invest in great communities because you can't take a community away uh, easily. And and when you when you think about kind of your former life in journalism, obviously the headline is a holy grail, right? How has your approach to crafting headlines evolved since the early days of Mashable, especially with the research you've done? It's the how, it's about the key words you want to utilize and what kind of emotion you want to evoke. Um, I think a lot of times, what kind of emotion do I want to evoke with this um, headline? And you don't always get it right. You just have to keep uh, trial and practice. And you got to keep it short and pithy, and you got to really... Uh, lead, got to lead with the punchline at the very beginning. Do you think your role as editor-in-chief helped you become a better writer? Um, so I, as co-editor, so I helped, I was co-editor-in-chief in West Coast. Uh, yeah, absolutely, because not only did I have to, did I write, but I also was uh, editing, oh gosh, way more articles than even what I wrote. I wrote 2,400 and so articles over the course of my Mashable career alone. But that editing also brought me a lot of knowledge in terms of management, in terms of uh, editing and style, made me more aware of you know when I my issues and mistakes and my structure. So let's go through the seven triggers. And as I mentioned each, will you give me your best example of them? Yeah. All right, let's go with the first one, automatic. Yeah, automaticity trigger, which is that we have this subconscious reaction to certain sights, sounds, and colors that really, really affects the way we pay attention. I think about heart bleed, for example. Heart bleed is a bug. It's a it's a bug in a computer system. Bugs don't ever get attention. Why did heart bleed? Part of the reason was because they a uh, codonomicon that created a symbol for the bug. This really, really simple and clear heart shape with drip with dripping blood. It had immediate invocations. You could immediately look at it and know what it meant. And it got shared everywhere because you could put that symbol in blog posts and an aw- and lots and lots of bloggers and lots and lots of mainstream publications did. I mean, it's also the subconscious associations with colors that really matters. Um, one interesting one was, uh, I think you probably saw this, but if you want to get picked up as a hitchhiker, especially for women, red is the best color to wear because of the subconscious associations we have with romanticism and red. And in fact, there was a French scientist who studied this. And you find out that there's all these interesting associations in each culture with color. Um, Brighter colors tend to have better contrast and thus capture more attention at a contrast level. But, you know, orange is great for a website button, but it's terrible for a business suit. In fact, orange and yellow have the lowest correlation with competence. So... Just think about it. If someone came in in a yellow suit, you'd kick them out of, kick them out of the office. Uh, but there's a reason for that, and that was the kind of interesting thing I learned with automaticity. And it's and it makes a heck of a lot of sense. You got some amazing examples in the book, but it really it gets you to rethink everything, especially nowadays your website, whether your website or your mobile app. It makes a huge difference. Oh no, absolutely. These little things have a huge impact on click throughs and um, purchase rates and very important things. You're not the first one to talk about the second one, framing, but you come at it from a different perspective. Talk to me about how framing grabs attention. So our frame of reference of the world, the the way in which we view it based on our biology and our culture and how we grew up, really impacts the way we pay attention. Your classic example is, let's say, global warming, depending on what party you're from, what party you associate with and what part of the country you're from. You, someone says that, and you might either pay huge amount of attention or no attention at all. 
Um, and it's and it impacts things like the media coverage, the channels we watch, um, even you know which musicians we listen to. And one of the interesting people I interviewed was a uh, violinist, Susan Kesser. And she's a street violinist in New York. And one of the interesting things I learned was she was able to get attention in New York because she knew her, how her audience thought. And she would make she knows not to play during rush hour, which is the least effective time and the worst frame of reference of her audience. And she knows to play in long hallways where people have time to absorb her music as they walk towards her. Yeah, it makes it's, it really makes a lot of sense. I mean, just your perspective of the world in general changes when you understand the science behind it, like you explain it. The third one is kind of the, the classic pattern, pattern interrupt, right? Disruption. Um, so, yes, disruption is one of the more powerful triggers. And the science shows that we pay attention to the things that violate our expectations. And I go into the research showing that the reason why is because we have to assess. It's a, a system for assessing threats. If a clown, a group of clowns, let's say, walks in on your in your co favorite coffee shop, you're going to immediately pay attention to them because it's out of place. And you're assessing, is this a good thing or a bad thing? You know, maybe it's a bunch of criminals that are about to rob you, or maybe it's a group of kids who are about to go and uh, perform at a children's hospital. You don't know, so you have to assess that potential threat. It's the same kind of thing in the past, you know, when we were hunter-gatherers, we were assessing threats all all the time when something was out of place. So, so before I get to the next one, something popped up as you were explaining that. You, there's a terrific example in there of David Copperfield, right? It really, in the book, it really got me thinking. We know he's an illusionist, right? He, or, or whatever you might want to call him, a magician. I mean, he's fabulous at what he does. But what about him intrigued you? Well, he was a fascinating interview. Um, I even got to interview him a second time on stage at a conference. Uh, Copperfield is... Well, for, for him, it's a couple things. He's always thinking about how his audience sees what he's doing, so it's a framing trigger thing. But with disruption, he's just always finding a way to defy expectations and make you, you know, be like, just draw you in and be like, that's not supposed to happen. And But he does in such a way where you're not, like, trying to question everything he does. You're just entertained, and every time he does something new, it just... It, it just captures your attention again. He's just a master at um, understanding his audience and uh, performing to violate their expectations. How was he to interview for you? I saw the Oprah interview with him, so I'm curious for you personally. I know you went at it with the intention to focus on the, the, the attention piece, but how was that interview? Oh, fantastic. Like I said before, um, you can tell he's a man who really thinks about how his audience perceives his performances. And he wants to make sure they get the best experience possible. And so he really is really, like, thoughtful is a good word to describe him. He's really thoughtful about um, about people's perceptions of not just him and his show, but just in general. Talk to me about the reward trigger. So the reward trigger is our propensity to pay attention to rewards because of the dopamine system in the body. And one of the key things I learned from... Uh, my interview with Dr. Kent Barrage of the University of Michigan is that uh, people think dopamine causes pleasure, but that's inaccurate. What it actually does is create desire and motivation to achieve a reward. It creates wanting. And so if you there's short-term extrinsic rewards like money, sex, food. And if literally you put money in a table, people's eyes in general will gravitate towards it more often than not because it's a reward, and we pay attention to it naturally. But that only works for short-term things. Long-term, you have to focus on intrinsic rewards, on things like self-worth and purpose and mastery. And you have to really focus on why – like money will get people to do a specific task, but money won't get people to uh, be an employee long-term. You have to focus on intrinsic motivations for that to work. So for so again, let's put yourself in the shoes of some of the startups you work with. This is obviously pretty critical. You get most of the time in the beginning, you've got limited resources. So you're hiring people when you know you're really you're selling them on your vision. They could go next door and probably make more money. How do you use a trigger like that to keep them engaged? I mean, it de it depends. There, there, there's you gotta you gotta focus on you gotta do both the intrinsic and the extrinsic. So, um, when you're initially recruiting, one of the things that um, I wrote about in the book was what Scopely did. Scopely is a startup, mm -hmm. and what they did was 
they made their reward surprising, their extrinsic reward, surprising and unusual, and that caught additional attention of engineers who they were trying to recruit. And so they, they parodied the most interesting man in the world contest by offering anyone who signed who joined the company a harpoon gun, a, a custom oil painting of themselves, a year's worth of beer, and, you know, $11,000 wrapped in bacon, like in cash. And that caught a lot of attention. And so one of the things that we found is that the more surprising reward or how you surprise people with it, the better. Uh, it's also just um, you got to the, – the extrinsic rewards for a startup are things like the equity and all that. But you got to really focus on the intrinsic is really selling them on. You know, This is I, both a place where you will be fulfilled because you will have gained some kind of – Master yourself, purpose, or have done something or learned something that you personally would not have been able to do anywhere else, and that motivation to change the world. That this company of all of all companies is really focused on a mission. On you know, when you're done, you're not only going to have extrinsic rewards like money, but you're going to know that what you did was good for the rest of mankind. I mean, I think about what Mark Zuckerberg does when he walks. He one of the famous things he does when he's recruiting top employees. Or prospects is he takes them out for a walk and he walks them around Silicon Valley and he shows them what the uh, future holds and what their purpose might be. And having that kind of effect from someone as with a stature like Zuck is a powerful thing on a person's psyche. Yeah, I mean, and I think we all know now we're kind of in an era, especially your generation, where I mean, intrinsic rewards without a doubt is what keeps us going. Abs yeah, absolutely. Over the long term, like I said before, both types of rewards capture attention, but intrinsic rewards are what uh, keep us motivated over the long term. It's all about uh, creating motivation in others. How about mystery, which is kind of your classic Hollywood theme? Well, mystery trigger, the science shows that we pay attention to incomplete stories, thoughts, and tasks for two main reasons. One is because we want to reduce uncertainty in our lives. And so imagine when you're on a date, what you're doing. It's you're asking questions back and forth. And the reason why is you're trying to figure out, is this person somebody I want to be with or hang out with or see again? And there's we feel uncomfortable with uncertainty. And so we try to reduce uncertainty. It's literally called uncertainty reduction principle. The other reason is that we have a stronger memory for incomplete tasks. And this is called the Zignaric effect. And what happens is that we get, we when we have an incomplete task, like in her case, she had students and children have complete puzzles, but half of them, she take the puzzles away halfway through. The only thing the children would remember was the incomplete puzzles, mm -hmm. because it was an incomplete mystery, it was an incomplete task, and they had a far greater memory for it. And so, mysteries, whether it's in radio or television, or in an ad campaign, or just in little things you do, uh, creates intrigue, creates suspense, creates attention. And that's, I mean, I would say that's one of the most important triggers, especially in media businesses and, you know, the opportunity to be able to create some type of drama matters. Well, there's, science also shows that we just, we feel a stronger affinity towards a story if we feel suspense uh, moment to moment. So having that element, it's a powerful, it's a very powerful emotional set. Mysteries are very powerful in the long term. You don't want to give everyone, everybody all the information up front. You want to have something that will bring them back for the second meeting or for the second episode. How about reputation? You talked about reputation a little bit earlier. And, I mean, that's with, with uh, the whole advent of social media. Reputation is becoming paramount for everyone. So talk to me about reputation as a trigger, number one. And then talk to me about the process of building the kind of reputation that's going to put you in that expert status that you discussed earlier. So I did talk a little bit about reputation. And like I said, there's just three categories, which is experts, authority figures, and the crowd. Uh, getting like The authority figures is pretty straightforward, which is essentially that um, we pay attention to authority figures so long as they have some kind of a power or authority over us. Once they don't, our attention wanes. And so it's not the most powerful type. The crowd is powerful because we want to be we're part of the like because we trust the crowd, and you think about things like the um, Yelp ratings and things like that. We really trust those because, in in a lot of senses, they're actually very accurate, more accurate than an individual expert. Um, you could fall into certain uh, holes in some cases, but experts are still by far the most powerful. And 
becoming an expert really just comes down to um, either like leading with your credentials or establishing your expertise, or maybe if you have a product, bringing in an outside expert to discuss your product or discuss what you're doing. Because of all the types of spokespeople, and Edelman does a trust survey every year uh, mm -hmm. measuring this, we trust experts the most, outside experts and academic experts and just experts in general, uh, more than CEOs, more than founders, more than government officials. We trust experts. And but so you don't you're not an expert overnight. No, you're not. You've got like establishing that expertise. It depends on what kind of thing. It can be through education. It can be through thought leadership, blog posts, social media, speaking through research, through books. There are lots of ways to establish legitimate expertise, which is what you need to do. And I also discuss how if you fake your expertise, you will get found out. This is the age of the Internet. You always get found out. You can't fake it for long. After a certain point, it'll not it'll not just bite you in the ass, but it'll take you down. So it just depends. What do you want to be an expert in, or what are you already an expert in? How do you really promote that? And the like, thought leadership, blog posts, things like that, really do help. And the educational aspect, the speaking aspect, you just have to consistently be discussing that topic and continuing to learn in that area. You say that the highest level of attention is acknowledgement. How do we get there? So acknowledgement is the final captivation trigger of my book, and acknowledgement is the fact that we pay attention to the people and the things that acknowledge us and provide us with validation, empathy, and understanding. And so with acknowledgement, I, I, one of the things I really learned is that with celebrities, part of the reason we pay attention to them is because they represent a piece of our identity. You know, it says something about yourself if you're a fan of Jennifer Lawrence versus Justin Bieber versus... Uh, Paul McCartney. It says something about who, where you're from, what you listen to, who you are, and it's a reflection of the community you want to belong to. And it's the same kind of thing for um, just why we become fans of certain products, like Apple. It's an identity, mm -hmm. and we want to feel like we're validated. Just even people just who giving us compliments provides us with that validation effect, because we just as humans need it. It's it's so incredibly powerful, and the people and the brands and the celebrities that really tap into that aspect, the desire for community and for acceptance from others, really are the most powerful masters of attention. So I want to get your perspective on something. When I had a, a kind of a mini reading of your book with a group of people, I always like to get their perspective before our conversation, and they asked me, share with me an example of attention that was not in the book. Right, so they put me on the spot. The one thing that would that really jumped, and I have no idea why. Maybe because I had watched basketball the night before on a Sunday. I remember when the USA basketball team was going to play in China at the Olympics, and obviously the 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 most recognizable, they're the tallest people on the planet, right? They land in China and they all got the beats by Dr. Dre on before they were ever released. And I had remembered hearing a story about LeBron's partner, you know, being... Maverick. Yeah, when Carter was told, hey, you hear these things that might be good. And then he said, hey, give me 15 of them, right? He said, give me 15 of them and, I, and I'll show you how to grab attention. And so he gave, one, he gave them to LeBron. He said, wear them as you guys deplane. Obviously, the media frenzy is going to be there. And just overnight this whole thing evolved and that not only captured attention but it was done in such a strategic way because their message was we're together you know that the team the gold medal is the most important thing which was i think symbolized dr dre's journey <laughs> they uh, beats by dre did a, did a fantastic job on the branding side what they they really understood what audience they were going after who their audience was and got the right people to represent it. And it was never a super blatant, obvious thing, like putting out thousands of commercials where where all these people, where these athletes especially and, and um, cutting-edge kind of celebrities were wearing them. They just wore them in their daily lives. And it was very authentic in the sense that, you know, they were using it. They loved these this product. And even when they had things happen, like when um, they had, I think it was Colin Kaepernick had the mm – -hmm. um, had the beats by Dre and you know they the NFL told him like you couldn't wear those things that only helped to beats by Dre and the you know the kind of like minorly rebellious uh image that beats by Dre has 
So absolutely, they found the right kind of people for it. Not obviously, not everybody can afford twenty top celebrities, you know, to wear their thing. But it's just they understood what the identity was, what the frame of reference of their audience was, and they really adapted to it. Ben, every na- everyone nowadays is a publisher. I got a couple more questions for you. What's your best when you think about journalism today? Obviously, there everybody is publishing something. What's your best guess of what journalism is going to look like in the next couple of years? Hmm. What's journalism going to look like? Like, there's. So the first thing you, whenever people talk about this, the first company they talk about is BuzzFeed. Mm-hmm. And what BuzzFeed does really well is that is the blend of you know, the fun and the silly with the very serious and the thoughtful. And they've done the perfect blend of it. And you'll see a lot more companies try to copy that. I also think you'll see a lot more companies like the Washington Post, where they have owners who don't have to make another cent of their lives and really investing in journalistic operations. I think you'll, it's, it's the continued decentralization of media and uh, the push to make it more relevant online. I like what things like what Vox does with its... Uh, news coverage, you know, helping explain what's going on in the world and having the, like, highlighting system and, uh, you know, it actually reminds me a little bit of what Genius and used to be Rap Genius does and the same kind of highlighting. It's the, like, I'm I'm bullish on the future of how media is going to continue to evolve in a positive way. It's, we just have some road bumps when it comes to how you monetize it and companies like BuzzFeed and Vox will probably lead the way on that. Well, and it is interesting. So for all the content creators out there, how do they measure impact? Is it still the same traditional, you know, page views and eyeballs or have, do you see something more innovative out there? The, here's the thing. Um, publishers would love to be way more innovative, but it's up to advertisers, the people who give them money. Advertisers still depend on things like page view, on page views and that for their metrics. And until they give that up and realize there are better metrics and page views for measuring the effectiveness of an ad, they um, like they need to figure that out. It's they it's it's really up to the advertisers what I think. I think there's a lot of new methods you see with BuzzFeed doing with things like like with some of their partnerships and sponsored content and their video stuff, which is doing very well and you know, that's why Vice does well and others do well. But it really just getting advertisers in the new mindset of there are better better ways of engaging audiences beyond page views. So would you say like BuzzFeed for example, it's the set ten things about this, the seven things about that lists matter, but are the headlines kind of the, the captivating thing for them? Is that what grabs us to click on it? No, it's the emotional resonance of the articles themselves. The headlines definitely help us click, but BuzzFeed itself has built a long-term brand. Um, again, it's not. It's they do things like fifty-four things that Minnesotans are too pra- are too humble to brag about, and that's a very power. That's an identity thing again. Acknowledgement trigger that you know BuzzFeed is trying to appeal to your a piece of your identity, and it allows you to create uh, to validate the piece of uh, your identity and. BuzzFeed does a great job of that um, in their quizzes, in their lists, while also doing the great journalism, like some great journalism that they've started really doing to have that blend, you know, bring people in for a breaking news story and then get them in senseless lists. And um, it's just a, they've done the combination right so far. All right, last question. What's a surefire way to lose one's attention, especially in a business meeting? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. Beyond your general be boring, it like it really comes down to when you start really focusing on yourself and not focusing on the people around you. Again, acknowledgement's the most powerful trigger. People pay attention to those who pay attention to them. And if you're paying attention to yourself, you're not paying attention to your team or to your clients. And if you're focusing too much on yourself, then you lose them immediately because no one wants to hear that. No one wants to feel that. No one wants to be a part of that. Uh, the smart, the, what I learned, one of the big lessons I learned is that the masters of attention don't focus on getting attention for themselves, but for their project, for their ideas, for their passions. And focusing on that really, really, really works. You just, it's just easy to lose attention the moment you start focusing, you don't focus on the people around you and you start focusing on yourself. Well, you're 
you're a pretty damn good example of that. For, <laughs> for those out there who want to learn more about the research, and I know this is probably just beginning for you in the book, where is the best place for them to go? So you can go over, I'm going to pull up Captivology right now. It's, you can go to Captivology.com, and the book is in you know Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all the other major bookstores. You can walk into a Barnes and & Noble and grab it. You can get an Audible, and you can get an audiobook. So just look for the uh, a teal cover with my face on it, and you'll find it. <laughs> we'll plaster your face. Thank you, Ben. No, thank you.